Uh, we started um, a couple weeks ago, we started um, a, a teaching, just a couple of Sundays, and we, we kind of semi-wrapped it up, but I'm going to segue, you know, the new term is segue, so we'll segue. Hallelujah. We used to, you know, some of you older folks probably understand this better, dovetail. Hallelujah. Dovetail into it. Yeah. Glory to God. You know, you, people now you segue, they segue. I'm like, I go look, is that the little thing you ride around on, or? <laughs> Hallelujah. What, is that, do they call those segues? Yeah, I say, so when somebody says they're going to segue into it, I'm thinking of that little two-wheel thing where you lean back. And, uh, well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about tying into it. Hallelujah. So, but we, we started a couple of Sundays ago on, on uh, Egypt, just ain't all that. Now, that, that phrase came to me by the Lord during Christmas. I was laying in bed, and uh, I woke up and just kind of laying there awake, and, and I heard the Lord say, Egypt, just ain't all that. And um, obviously, and I knew what he was talking about as soon as he said that, so it became a, a, a couple of sermons there. On, you know, how that, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's amazing how people can come out, of the, come out of the things of the kingdom of darkness, come out of the world, and, and go down the road just a little bit, and next thing you know, they're ready to go back. Lord, supernatural, after 400 years of bondage, after 400 years of captivity, after 400 years of making brick for the Egyptians, you know, I mean, living, you know, as slaves in that land, they get set free, and we reach, reach one hard place in the new land, and they're ready to go back. You know, <clears throat> and that's just flesh. And see, your flesh is more comfortable with, it, with what it knows than walking by faith. Oh, yeah, it is. Your flesh would rather go live in bondage than live by faith. Mm-hmm. That went over real big, but it's true. Yeah. Um, look, a few, so we're going to tie in. Let me read again the last part of what we were, and then we'll tie into that with another scripture and go on to the next thing here. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we started reading in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Now, Paul says here, and let me put it in modern English, I don't want you stupid. All right? How that our fathers were under that cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat all the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, and they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But when the many of them, that, with, with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were for our example. Remember last week we said, you know, there's a lot of people who run around and say, "Don't read the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. That was for the Jews. We're the New Testament believer." And here Paul says they wrote, they were written for our example. Right. Now if they're written for our example, we're supposed to learn something from it, aren't we? Yeah. I don't care if somebody said God showed me. You know, God showed me this, and, and, and I asked, Lord, why, why, Lord? We just had a, we had a conversation, and they never give you scripture for what the Lord showed them. And then they claim to be like Dad Hagen. You know, Brother Hagen used to say the Lord showed him something, and he told the Lord, now, Lord, I'm going to need scripture for that, and I'm going to need at least two or three witnesses. And the Lord told him one time, he said, I'll do you one better, I'll give you four. <laughs> Hallelujah. He, says, he said, I, you know, I know you're appearing to me, I know you're telling me you're standing here, and, and I see you. He says, but if, I can't, if you can't prove it in the Bible, I can't accept it. You, know, you got people running around saying, the Lord showed me this, the Lord showed me that, and they don't give me any scripture for it. Let me tell you something, folks. If we don't have scripture for it, we can't stand on it. I don't care what the Lord showed anybody and what the Lord told anybody. If you can't prove it out with the word, we can't follow it. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> so he said these were written for our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. As they, now, the Amplified Bible says evil and carnal things. That's, that gives me more clarity because then if it's evil and, and carnal, you know, it's just like Hebrew says, now let's lay aside the weights and the sins that those, those so easy to beset us. What are sins? Evil. What are weights? Carnal. They're things that hold you back. Amen. It may not be sin, but it'll hold you back. Good. Glory to God. Um, as they lusted, neither be idolaters as some of them, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink. Some rose up to, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication. Now, i got people running around saying it's all right to fornicate. What's fornication? Real simple. Any sexual sin, outside, any sex outside of marriage, and that is between a man and a woman, is fornication. It's a sin. Well, I just think, I just think God understands. God don't understand. He told you not to. And he told one, into one place, he told him, Paul wrote the church and said, look, look, if you can't control your flesh, it's better to marry than to burn. Somebody say thank you for that enthusiastic uh, statement there. 
A lot of us don't like that. I don't really care if you like it or not. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. And that's just between, that's, you know, you just have to deal with that because you've got to deal with God after that. Amen. So they just, let us not commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. God don't care. Well, 23,000 died. Thank God cares. Hello? Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them were tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh -oh. Now, like we said last week, you say, well, God talks to me just like he does to Pastor Ed. Yeah, Miriam and Aaron tried that with Moses. You're right. Hello? So, what, what, was Moses always right? No, we felt in a lot of places Moses wasn't right. Right, right, not the point. That's exactly right. It wasn't the point. <laughs> so, we, we can't... <clears throat> don't try the Miriam path. You don't want to be like Miriam. No, you don't. What happened to Miriam? She got leprosy and was put out of the camp. Moses had to intercede to get her back in. Yeah. Cool. Hello? Now, all these ha things happen unto them for in samples. The word in samples means types. Okay? And are written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. Then we went on, there's no temptation, but so, take heed but such as common to man, meaning everything you face, people face. Okay? <clears throat> but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but with the temptation, make a means of escape. Now, he makes a means of escape, but it doesn't say he does away with the temptation. What is the means of escape? Doing what he said in his word. Submitting to the word. Now, let's run over from here. We're going to tie on here because we're talking about Egypt's not all that. Going back into Egypt, you, listen, there's nothing in Egypt. You, there's nothing you left behind that's worth going back for. When you came out of the kingdom of darkness, there's nothing you left back there that's worth going back for. Oh, yeah, but you know, before I got saved, I used to do this. And that was all right. I could have fun doing that. It's not worth it. I said it's not worth it. Now, look over to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at Hebrews 11 now in verse 15. Well, actually, we're going to start a little bit before that. Um. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. Now listen, the Bible says that, you know, let us, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that is to easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set us before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our gaze, our focus is to be set on Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. It is not to be set on what you could do and get away with what you used to do. Come on now. Well, I don't see anything wrong with doing this. I don't think there's anything wrong with smoking some cigarettes and dipping some snuff and, you know, smoking some pot and, you know, getting me along that Bud Light during the football game. That's all. You know, let me tell you something. That's all the stuff you came out of. Where is your gaze supposed to be? Well, it's all right to cuss. Really? Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. We're supposed to be speaking words of life and peace. Amen? Hallelujah. And true, listen to this, for they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. What is it? Their gaze, their fix, their focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the kingdom of God. Verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, listen to this, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now the Amplified Bible says they would have had a constant opportunity to return. When you start looking back at your past life and trying to figure out what it was that you did that you can still do and be a Christian, you're looking to the other country, and you're going to have an opportunity to return. What are you doing? You're becoming carnal in your thinking. You're letting carnality govern your thought life. You're letting the thoughts of the flesh dictate to you how you live. Instead of gazing on Jesus, that's what I saw Nathan singing this morning about. You know, daddy, so, he, he hears daddy come and say, clean your room, boy. <laughs> hears that a lot. Yes, Nathan, when, when you get to the house today, guess what? Daddy's home. Want that room cleaned up. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, prophesied out of your own mouth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Preach to yourself. Amen. I'm messing with you now. No, I'm not really. Clean the room up. But when we, when we, we listen, he's, 
he said here that if they had been mindful of remembering where they came out of, they would have had a constant. I, I better read that right because I want to make sure I don't want to misquote it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wrong Bible. Holy, holy Bible. All right. Hebrews. Hebrews is in the Bible, isn't it? Is it in your Bible? And it's in my Bible. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 15. Amplified. There we go. Here we go. Now I got her. It says here, if they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country from which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity to return to it. Constant. See, how, how is it that we come out of the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his dear son, and then after we go down the road a little ways and we, we kind of, you know, we get over the euphoria of getting saved and no longer being damned to hell. Mm -hmm. Hello. That we're going to spend eternity in hell. Now, now we're deliberated, we're set free, we're going to be with the Father, we're going to heaven. And all of a sudden, somewhere there we start thinking, it's cool to be able to do some of the stuff I used to do and, and, and serve God. Why do you want to go back to anything you got, got free from? He delivered you. Your gaze is to be on him. We're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're to be looking into the most high God. We're to be, you know, come out from among them and be ye separate. Be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. The question should not be, what can I do and get away with it? The question is, how far away from all that junk can I get? Why? Because every bit of that junk has claws and tentacles. It wants to wrap around you and have, give you a constant opportunity to return to that life. Amen. So we are, you know, somebody says, well, you can't prove that, that uh, such and such is wrong. I, I can't prove smoking dope is wrong. There's no scripture. Thou shalt not smoke marijuana. But is it carnal? Is it catering to your flesh? Is it, is it giving your flesh, uh, actually, is it put your flesh in an altered state? <laughs> yeah. It's wrong. Uh, the Bible, you know, well, it's called, I'm going to Colorado. Churches out there ain't, can't preach against smoking dope anymore because it's legal. Just because it's legal don't mean it's right. There's a lot of things that are legal don't make them right. We, we don't go by the world standards. We go by the standard of the word of God. And we're to come out from among those things. We're not to be mindful of the country we came out of. Well, what is that? That being mindful of the country you came of, having a remembrance of the things you used to do, and trying to figure out what you can do and get away with it and still not go to hell is a sign of immaturity. And see, we're supposed to grow. We're supposed to move closer to God and not, you know, reach the limitations of, you know, reach that place of point of no return. I'm not going back. I can't go to hell now, so I can just do whatever I want to do. That's not what it's about. You know, the Bible says that you are living epistles known and read of all men. People are watching you. My wife reminds me of that all the time. <laughs> Amen. People are watching you know? And I don't know about you, in my house, the Holy Ghost is five foot, one and a half inches tall. <laughs> Hallelujah. Me and your wife might be taller, but the Holy Ghost just is, is, is relevant, you know. Yeah, but people do watch you. And, and they're, they're everywhere. You don't even know they're there. We walked in, we were, went up to uh, uh, one of Dad Hagen's meetings back when he went up to... Uh, um, uh, not Charles Cowan, but um, Bill, Bill, um, the other guy in, in Nashville. Um, it looks like Charles Cowan's brother. I can't remember his name. Bill McRae. 
Thank you. Bill McRae's church, and one of his faith in the, is the Victory Church, the other one's Victory Church, or Victory Fellowship. And Dad was doing a meeting up at Bill McRae's church. And so we went up to, the, to a Cracker Barrel up on the north side of Nashville there. We're standing in line at the, at the wait station to get, get seated. And this, the, one of the uh, hosts, not a hostess, but host, comes up to us and goes, Pastor Ed! I, I used to go to Faith and Victory in Greenville when you were an assistant pastor there. You probably didn't know me because the church was so big, you know. Yeah. People, people know where you are. They'll find you in the Cracker Barrel in Nashville. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have on my, my shirt, Born to Raise Hell. I mean, R-A-I-S-E, not R-A-Z-E, you know. You know, and, and sitting there with my, my six-pack tucked under my sleeve there, you know. Hallelujah, with a chaw in my mouth. I'm in, I'm in Nashville. Nobody knows me here. Uh, yeah, pa- Pastor Ed! That's right. You have swallowed it. I don't do any of those. I never, never, I never did this, this anyway. I saw them women dip snuff in the tobacco barn. That was enough for me. That was just too... That, anyway. Yeah, oh, oh, oh yeah. Tobacco barns. Oh, oh women would sit there and there go. Mama Rose's snuff right down here. You know, right down there. And they could cuss you and cut you at the same time. Anyway, you know, you're being watched. You're a living epistle known and read of all men. Do you know we live by a higher standard? That went over big. We live by a higher Come on, say amen. amen. Nobody wants to hear this, but it's true anyhow. We live by a higher standard. Now, we got preachers running out all over the place now telling everybody we can lower our standard. We can win more people. No, you can't. Go look at our educational system. Has it gotten better or worse since we lowered the standard? Come on now. We lowered the standard so low now that the education system in our country stinks. Outward bound education. Outcome based education. You know, we pass them. We don't tell them. I mean, they got teachers can't even use a red marking pen anymore on their papers because it, it's, it's too negative for the children. We have to give them a, F, you know, a, an A for trying. Um, in some place, they, they, can't even, they can't even fail them anymore. Yeah, they have to need to retake. They get an NR, need to retake. They can't get F because it's bad on their psyche. And the church comes in and says, let's lower the standards for the believers and we'll win more sinners. No, you won't. You'll just get sinners think, you know, thinking you're playing a game with them and exactly what you're doing. They'll come to your church and say, man, I can smoke dope, drink, fornicate, and still come to church. That's cool, man. No, it's not. I said, no, it's not. This is childish mess. This is childish thinking. And the Bible tells us that we're to be, see, we're to be a standard setter, a standard bearer. We're to live like God. Be ye holy even as I am holy, says the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Hello? There's a a glaring example in the old covenant of God's demand on his people versus those of the world. You want to hear it? See, when when, when the, uh, the, the enemies of Israel came, they went and took the Ark of the Covenant and ran off with it, and not one of them died. But when, they, when, when David's men went back and got it, and they were bringing it back, it started to fall, and somebody reached up and touched it to steady it and died on the spot. There's a higher demand on God's people for how they live than for the world. God expects us to live holy and pure and separated and godly. Sinners get away with stuff because they're sinners. Christians can't get away with it. Thank you. I think Clunk should have just nosedived. <laughs> Clunk the cow. God wants us to grow in Him. God wants us to be like Him. God wants us to act like Him. That's what Nathan was saying. Do you really see the Lord doing the things you think you can get away with? Man, y'all there? Y'all all gone home. 
You're getting mighty quiet. God is bidding the church. How is he going to bring the fullness of his glory through a church that is tainted without destroying his own people? <coughs> Hello? How is he going to bring the power through us? If we don't live the way we're supposed to live. Amen. So we're to, we're to come out and we're to, we're to live a holy life. We're to live a sanctified life. A separated life. Egypt just didn't all that. There's nothing there. If you go back, it's going to be just like it was before. Yeah, actually, it will be worse. Ephesians chapter 4. You hot? Yeah, I'm, whew, it's hot. Glory to God. I'm getting ready to move to the fourth row. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writing to the church, referring and talking about the body of Christ. I was reading chapter 15 there. That's five. That's not going to work. He's, he's just talked about he's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love. The truth in love. And let me say something, folks. Truth is not always going to be nice. It can be in love and still not, you still not like it. Hello? I've, I've told my kids stuff in the past, you know, and, and, and uh, they may have gotten upset and thrown a fit. Didn't throw fits long in my house. Now, I don't know about you, but if they got down on the floor and started kicking and screaming, they got their backside wore out. Well, I don't believe a spanker. You don't believe the Bible. He who spares the rod hates his child. You know, the old country folks say, spare the rod, spoil the child. No, you hate them. Why? Because you're letting them develop an attitude that's ungodly that will go within the rest of their life if you don't straighten it out now. That little terror needs their backside wore out. Hallelujah. <laughs> that they henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that went, lie in wait to see, speaking the truth and love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted about that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in every part, um, uh, of every part, making increase to the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, we're to grow up. Every time to grow up. Say, so God called me as a believer to grow up. Now, I am supposed... To come to the point, I put away childish things. Now, your spiritual fit throwing ain't going to work. Now, it might work in a lot of churches, but it won't work with God. There's a lot of churches that give in to people because they throw spiritual fits and let them get away with all kinds of stuff because they're throwing spiritual fits, but it won't work with God. Hello? That went over big. But I want to do this. So what? You know, instability in believers. See, now, we, we have this thing where Christians come into the kingdom, they serve God for a certain number of time, maybe two, three, four years, and all of a sudden they've grown to a certain point where they think they've got it, they got a hold on it. Can I tell you something? No, you don't. Even, your, even when your kids get, you know, college age, you know, and this is why professors in colleges love to get a hold of them, because they know they're not stable yet. They want them to all go off to college somewhere. They want to get them out from mom and their mom and dad. They want to get them in the dorms. They want to bring them into the classrooms. And they want to break them down and fill them with all their communist, socialist, I mean, uh, socialist garbage and reprogram them as, you know, these, uh, these little commies running around all over the place. It's true. 
They reprogram. You got you got one one university in our country has renamed one of their buildings the 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 uh, the Vladimir Lenin Building. He is you know, the major communist. His statues were torn down all over Russia, and we're naming buildings after him here. Hello, why? Because they're not quite settled yet. They're not, they, they, they're, 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 they come in and tell you, they try to prove because they got all those degrees. Your parents don't know what they're talking about. They're stupid. We know everything we're talking about because we got education. And then they repro try to reprogram into their mindset. And that's why a lot of kids drop out or flunk out the first year or two in college because they went up there and they got reprogrammed by these professors. <clears throat> what? They're not stable. That's, that's the idea. Not every college is like that. My goodness. But you know, the good majority of our colleges are like that. That's, that's the, you got professors with tenure. And that's their goal. Mm -hmm. Their philosophy is off. You can't even take a religion course at a university now without having some atheist teaching it. They're all teaching the religion courses because they want to destroy it. Tear it down and destroy it. Well, see, we're not to be children. We're not to be unstable. We're to be stable. Well, see, in spiritual things, we reach this same thing too. And we come to a certain place in spiritual growth, and all of a sudden, we know everything. Know more than the pastor? Been in ministry 30, 40 years, and you know more than the pastor. You got more revelation than he ever got, ever got. And God shows you stuff every 30, I had my roommate had an angel every, day, every other day. I'm telling you, I'm, te I'm not joking with you. My roommate had it. Every time I turn around, there's my angel, there's my angel, there's my angel. And I'm, hold your eyes real tight, real, and I open them up, hope No angel. Never saw, I still hadn't seen mine. <laughs> Me neither. That I know of. Oh, cool. Now I could get, you know, kind of symbolic, but I'm married to my angel. How many brownie points did that get me? <laughs> We're going to have brownies for dessert at home now. Hallelujah. With ice cream and a chocolate milkshake from the cookout. Instability. See, when you get, when you get to a place and you think, well, you know, I can still do what I used to do and get away with it. And your pastor's up there saying, live holy, don't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, but I, where I, I know it's all right. That's childish. And you've been listening to somebody. I'm not telling you you shouldn't be doing things because we don't want you to have fun. I like to have fun. I do. But I want to have fun in a way that's godly and not ungodly. In a way that's not going to cause my flesh to take control of everything. I'm not going down to the pub and getting drunk while I watch the football game this afternoon because I want to have fun and it's okay. Do they have pubs here? <laughs> that. Right answer, son. Very good answer. You still have to clean your room. <laughs> Paul even upbraided Christians who were babes in Christ uh, after they were been Christians for almost five years over 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4. The writer of Hebrews deals with the same basic problem. When he talks about when you ought to be teachers, you become those who have need of milk. Okay? Here he says that they, that they lie in wait with cunning crafts. It comes, that word cunning comes from the Greek word cube, which was literally of dice throwing. You know, tricksters using multiple dice to change the, change the game. You know, you got Christians teaching things that are like cunning tricksters. Let me, let me let's just be real honest today. Why are many people teaching certain things they teach? Because they get some money. People buy their books and people give to their ministries. And they don't care the outcome or the, or, the, or the fallout in your life. All they know is they're getting wealthy off of it. Hello. <coughs> they lie in wait. The Bible actually says people lie in wait with cunning craftiness. You need a good, you got a good pastor. You don't need one, you got one. I'll fight for you and tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it. I'll tell you the truth when other people want to hear something, when other people are telling you something else, and people are leaving and going to hear the something else. But you still get the truth here. And you're not going to get something else here. You're just not going to get it. Why? 
Because the outcome of your life, the destiny of your life, the end result of your life is contingent upon what you're feeding on and what you're getting and the truth that you get. And if I don't give you what you have need of, you can fall by the wayside and that will be on my hands when I stand before the Lord. And so I'm going to give you the truth whether you like it or not. But there are people out there waiting and cunning crashes to tell you it's okay to live in sin. It doesn't matter. Because you're under grace. Yet the word of God makes a demand on you. <clears throat> Let me tell you, church. There was, there was a teaching. There was teachings out back in the, um, about 2008, 2009, 2010, about a coming separation in the church around 2011, about the church that would be spiritual. And, and I'm just going to use different terminology than, than they were using, but this is what they were saying. There's going to be a church that is, that is spiritual and seeks after God, and there's going to be a church that's carnal, that seeks after the flesh. And around that time came this extreme grace teaching. And people, I'm telling you, word of faith, people who, who could quote Scripture right and left fell for that teaching all over the place. And, let, and now they go to sit in Bible schools and mock the teachers because, you know, of what they're, when they're trying to bring correction about it because they know more than the teachers. No, you don't. Hello. But there, that separation has started. And the Bible tells you to beware of those who are lying in wait. They're there with cunning craftiness. They're looking to deceive you. They're looking to tell you to go back and live by your flesh. You can't live in the flesh. They that walk in the flesh. Amen. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. My God. We have to tell you, and I'm telling you, you've got to learn to live out of your spirit, not out of your flesh. Your flesh has nothing. What is your flesh? Egypt! It is your Egypt. It is bidding you to come back. Come on home. I mean, it's singing, come on home. <laughs> it's singing, it's okay, it's wonderful over here. It's singing, we got, we got all kinds of cool stuff over here. You can drink and smoke and do all the stuff you want to do and still go to heaven. Woo! And the Spirit of God bids you to come up higher. There are places you cannot achieve in the Spirit walking in the flesh. And here's the, here's the, the next statement. You'll never even know you missed it if you walk in the flesh. You'll walk right by it. Hello? Now, in the natural, I'm probably one of the most unaware human beings on the planet. <laughs> Apparently, Caps is following in my footsteps. <laughs> my wife or the girls or even Nathan go, hey, look at that. Da -da 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 -da. I'm like, where? And I'm looking all over. Right there. Well, not, I don't see it. It was right there. It was right there. And then if, we, if we're driving and, we, and, and somebody misses it, it's because I'm going too fast. <laughs> so it's still my fault. Did I? Three brownie points down. You know, just, just moved it back over to the negative side. <laughs> and then that, man, I'll tell you what, though, the kids are, are well, all, and Janie will be going, oh, look at that, look at that. And I'm going, where, 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 where? Because you see, most of the time when I'm, going, when I'm doing things, I'm so busy and locked in on what I'm doing, I'm unaware of stuff around me. Janie just walks up behind me and just kind of hits me, not, not, not abusively, but hits me with her hand or something, let me know, because I'll turn right around and run over her. <laughs> I'm just so focused on what I'm doing, I don't even know she's back there. She can walk up behind me, and if she doesn't let me know she's back there, and just saying something don't work, because I'm, I'm, I'm zoned. Let me say this. This is what happens with your flesh. You get zoned with your flesh. Your flesh can get so, so loud. And you can get so in tune with your flesh. You can walk right past spiritual things and things God's trying to do <clears throat> and miss every bit of it. See, we're to grow to the point that we become sensitive to the voice of the Holy Ghost. We're not to dull our ability to hear it. We're to tune in our ability to hear Him. 
we're to become more aware of God, not less aware of God. How do I become less aware of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hello? Are y'all here? You gone home? Where you are more aware of... Um... <laughs> Get back here. What did it say that? I want, I, want to read, I want to quote that verse. These things are written for our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil or carnal things as they lusted. See, when you grow in the Lord, well, how do I grow in the Lord? <coughs> when you grow in the Lord, you give yourself to the spiritual things and not the natural things. We need to stop trying to prove we can do stuff that's carnal and still go to heaven and just focus on walking with the Lord. Stop trying to find a reason that you can still do this and it's okay. Why are you doing that? Because your flesh wants to do it. Does your spirit really want to do that? I got people looking at the ground, looking at the ceiling, looking at their neighbor. Look at me. I know you don't want to hear this. No, no, you do. Your flesh don't. It's your flesh is fidgeting. You're, if you could tune in your spirit right now, he's going, yeah, preach, pastor. And your flesh is going, get out, run, run. Hit the back door. Joe, lock them. You can't get out. No. We have, we, God's calling us to a higher place. We're, we're to get away from the cunning craftiness of those who want to deceive. Amen? We're to be obedient to Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, we, we grow from the Word. Now, 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire sincere milk that you may grow thereby. How many remember what it was like when you first got saved? You couldn't keep you out of church. Come on now. Man, coming to church, I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And you go down the road a little bit, and all of a sudden, you're trying to figure out a reason that you got to go. And then find reasons that give their legitimate excuse to stay away. Oh, I got a sniffle. I can't go today. It might infect everybody. Before you're going, I'm going to church to get healed in Jesus' name. How many know what I'm talking about? See, that's, see what happened. See, when you were a baby, you were just, you were just babies. I, feed me. See, Jesse, when she was a baby, I remember we, we took her that, I remember, remember that restaurant on High Point Road, it used to be called Po' Folks. Yeah. Them folks could cook, too. Now, we had a hard time going in there just because of the name of the place, but it was good food. And Jesse would take garden peas and shove them up her nose. <laughs> That's what she used to do. She won't touch a garden pea now. Won't touch them. When she was a baby, she was just shoving it down. Amen. Now she, I don't like them. What do you mean you don't like them? You used to eat them strained. You used to eat them up your nose. You ate them every way possible to eat them. Now you don't like them? See, and we, we get that way spiritually growing. We'll come along, we'll start out on the Word of God, and the Word's so good, the Word's wonderful, the Word's this, and all of a sudden, I don't like that. I don't like that commitment teaching. I don't like that separation from the world teaching. Can, ha, 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 holiness teaching. Living <laughs> holy. Uh, well, ha, what's happened? See, now you, you, you're just trying to determine what you like and don't like. See, when it comes to the Bible, you don't get to pick. The counsel of God's word is the counsel of God's word. And whether you like it or not becomes irrelevant. You have to renew your mind to think in line with the word of God. And stop looking for buddies who are going to tell you what you want to hear. 
Hello? Well, my opinion, I don't care what your opinion is. What does the Bible say? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. The whole counsel of God's word is what we listen to. Amen. Why? Because it will, it will save your life. It will change the way you think. It will deliver you in the time of, the, of destruction. It will deliver you in the time of calamity, glory to God. It'll, say, it'll, it'll lift you out of, the, out of the mire, glory to God. The Word of God will take you from a place of, of, of destruction and a place of sickness and a place of death and bring you into the land of the living, glory to God. So you need all of it. Can you imagine somebody going into the service? And then coming up to them with an M16 and saying, this is your weapon. <laughs> I don't like that. I want, I want one of those little, I want a billy stick. I want to be like an English police officer. I think guns are bad. Tell that to a guy who's trying to kill you. Okay, can we play fair? No. Hello? Now you're holy, but not H-O, not W-H-O. -H you don't get to pick and choose. Are you here? When it comes to the kingdom of God, the word of God is your life support system. The word of God is what tells you what you can and can't do. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to let your mind be changed, your thinking be changed, and line up with what the word of God says. That book's antiquity. Men wrote that. Come on and give me a stinking break. 1,500 years and it all lines up. 3,000 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and they all came to pass just like they said. Things written thousands of years before he came. The 22nd Psalm written and says this, they looked on him whom they pierced. 1,500 years before crucifixion became a form of capital punishment. 1,500. Not 15 years. 1,500 years before crucifixion became a form of capital punishment. And they looked on him whom they pierced. Jesus was crucified. He was pierced with the nails. And they, over and over and over and over again, Scripture proves out that the Bible is the Word of God. It's old-fashioned antiquity. We live in a modern era. You live in dummy era. People are educated beyond their intelligence. How do you, how do you get, get educated beyond your intelligence? You reject God. You think you're smarter than God. And we already know what happens to people who say, I'm going to ascend in the heavens. I'm going to exalt my throne above the Most High. I will be as the Most High. And you're going to leave at the speed of light. How do you know that? The Bible said that of, of, of Lucifer, the morning star, all that he said all those things. And then the book of Revelation said, or Jesus said in Luke, he said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. That's the speed of light. He came out of that 186,000 miles a second. Probably in warp nine. Hello. That's fast. They warped. The time-space continuum. He came out of heaven at, war at light speed because he began to think he knew more than God. You don't know more than God. You need his word. You need to grow by his word. You need to let the word of God change the way you think. Hello? We're, we're born by the word. We grow by speaking the word, Ephesians 4.15. We're to become skillful in the word. We grow individually and we grow as a body. Your life is dependent, your, your, your destiny is dependent upon putting your flesh under and getting back to doing what God said to do. The way God said to do it. Getting, listen, hold on now, can I say this? Everybody smile. Get your attitude straight. Stinking thinking will mess you up. It will. Counsel someone now that long ago, and uh, they, they are mad at God. I told them, you're on dangerous ground. Who do you think you are to be mad at God? 
That sounds, you know, some people think that sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm mature enough that I can be mad at God. No, you can't. Why don't you just go on up to the throne room and walk in there? What's happened? We've become so carnal in our thinking that we don't see God as who he is anymore. Because I'm going to tell you, if you saw God as he is, Now, like I said, I just watched the Ten Commandments the other night, all three hours and 39 minutes plus intermission. And Blu-ray. Woo! Glory to God. Charlton never looked better. <laughs> now, how many remember this? He saw the burning bush and said, I will turn aside and see this great sight. He gets up there and a voice speaks to him. Take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. Boom! End of cocky situation. He says, Moses, he said, here am I. When the conversation was over, he said, you're going to deliver my people? He said, uh, who am I? Yeah. See, people are real, they think they're so tough. You've got to get your thinking straightened out. You can't be mad at God, and you can't go tell God off. Well, God's cool, he can understand it. No, God's not cool, he don't understand it. He's God. And he's holy. Hello? He takes a speck of sand and a drop of water in his hands and weighs the balance of the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brother Hagin said one time that, he, when, when, how many of you have ever read the book, I Believe in Visions? You need to go back and read it again if you haven't read it. Dad Hagen's book, I Believe in Visions, talks about, I think, the eight visions he had between 1940, uh, 1940, whatever, to, you know, about a ten, 10-year period there. And in one of the visions, remember he, he's, the Lord's talking to him, and this demon spirit came out and started going, yeah, kitty, yak, yeah, kitty, yak, yeah, kitty, yak. And, and he's like, well, I can, hear, I can see the Lord, I can see his mouth, but I can't hear what he's saying. And that demon's just going, yeah, kitty, yak, yeah, kitty, yak. <coughs> And finally, he just got frustrated and said, I command you in Jesus' name to shut up. So the demon spirit from plop says, get out of here in Jesus' name. And he ran off, and the Lord stopped everything he said to him and says, if you hadn't done anything about that, I couldn't have. And Dad Hagin said, he said, I shook my head and went, now, Lord, I, I know you didn't say you couldn't have done anything about it. You said you wouldn't have done anything about it. He said, I said that if you hadn't done anything about that, I couldn't have. Now, Lord, Lord, something's wrong with my hair. I know, and he said about three times, he said about the fourth time he did that, the Lord looked at him, he said he, he, saw, he saw his eyes turned to fire he said I said if you hadn't done anything about it I couldn't have but that's when he said well you have to show that to me in scripture then he said he went from the fire in his eyes to okay I'll give you four <laughs> don't think you can play with God I think we've lost a reverence for the holiness and purity and majesty of the Most High God. To where we're playing church and we're playing with the things of the Spirit and we're playing in the house of God and we're not coming in realizing He's a holy God. And we need to grow up and stop being childish and become mature about the things of God. Healing is not a toy. The gifts of the Spirit are not so you can run around and be some cool dude and grow people. You will grow? I'm going to grow you. I'll lay hands on and minister to people when they need it. And if the Spirit of God tells me to do something, I'll do it. But I don't run around and try to use, play with his gifts. They're holy. They're pure. He's a holy God. Let me say something. And you need to start living your life like that. Go ahead. Just know this, the Lord's with me. <laughs> Amen. Y'all here, y'all going, how many stay here? There's a cry of the Spirit of God into the church. And, and I'm thinking, I'm looking on Facebook and I'm seeing preachers and they're starting to say it. There's, there's people finally saying, I've had enough of this, this loosey-goosey. I've had enough of this playing with the things of God. There are people beginning to say what we've been saying for three, four, five years other than myself. Thank God. People don't like it. Pastor Hagin says some stuff. People don't like it. I don't care. I love Pastor Hagin. He's my mentor. Kids say, you and, you and Pastor are just alike. You know? 
this bull in China shop. Ha! They talk about how much, how much personality-wise we're like, you know. I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. <laughs> That's the way it is. Yeah, yeah there's a the door. <laughs> I've heard him say it. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> On the way out. <laughs> He's mellowed something. That was, that was a number of years ago. He still thinks that I know. We... God's calling us out. It's time to grow up, people. It's not about whether you get a Cadillac next week. It's not about whether you have a 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 square foot house and you've got gold rings on every finger. It's not about whether you've got a cruise liner for your, for your houseboat. It's about serving God and growing in God and being a vessel of God and being light to the nation's glory to God. Our faith is to grow, and, the, and, and when you look at what they did with their faith, they, they turned nations upside down. They said, they that have turned the world upside down have come hither. These were men of great faith. Amen. We've got to stop being silly and foolish and thinking we can be cool by saying, I'm mad at God. You took one look at him in his, in his face and you stood before the throne of God. You would not even try to even, those, you'd probably be knocked down on the ground for even thinking like that. Just in his presence. Moses showed up cocky and left humbled. Who am I to speak for you? I'll have Aaron do the talking. Isaiah got into, a, got into a vision, and they said, who will go for us? And he said, woe am I. See, I'm telling you, the presence of God will strip you of every encumbrance, encumbrance, everything that stands between you and a pure and humble life, the presence of God. And I'm going to tell you something. That's why a lot of Christians don't want to be there. They don't want to give up things. They don't want to give up this. They don't want to get into that holy place of God where the purity of His presence speaks to the things in your life that you don't want to let go of. Well, I want to be able to do this and still serve God. And His presence is stripping it out of your life. So we shut that door and go live carnal so we don't have to get that stripped out because we want to do it. Is, it. is Egypt really worth that? What did you leave back there that's just so great? Now think about this. Not only did they cry, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt with the promise that I'm going to take you into a land that flows with milk and honey and the dew of the land waters the land. You won't have to do it with the treading out using the treadmills. They had invented treadmills to, pump, to create water pumps. You won't have to do that. The land itself will water itself from the hills into the valleys. And they appointed the captain to take them back. They knew treading treadmills to get water. They did not know the life of the Spirit where the land itself watered itself. And so they were willing to go back to what they knew and miss the supernatural blessings of God because their flesh was talking louder than their spirits. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know today there's a land that flows with milk and honey in the Spirit. There's a land that's watering itself with the dew upon the mountains and into the valleys. That it's a land where you rest from the labors of the flesh and live the life of the Spirit that God is calling you to. So tell Egypt, you're just not all that. I didn't leave anything back there that I want to go pick up. Now, we do know that Israel got, got rebuked and spent 40 years in the wilderness. They didn't have to. God did not make them spend 40 years in the wilderness. The reason they spent 40 years in the wilderness is they rejected. They, they, they brought up an evil report before the Lord. Go read it in Numbers. 
And the people brought up an evil report before the Lord. And they said, there are giants in the land. And we are grasshoppers in their sight. Because we were, we were as grasshoppers in, their, in our sight. And so we were in theirs. And Joshua and Caleb tried to steal the people. And said, let us go up at once and possess the land. For we are well able. They said, no. The giants be strong and the, wheel, the cities are walled. Dummy. The cities were built and the land was tilled and cultivated and the vineyards were planted and the crops were planted waiting on you to come take possession. It was turnkey ready for a nation. They were going to go in and possess the turnkey plan of God. And instead they had to spend 40 years wandering around because their flesh got in the way again. <clears throat> they get hungry. God said, all right, and sent manna. The word manna means, what is it? It was, it was supernatural food. And they got tired of eating manna and started complaining. We're tired of this manna. So God sent quail until it was running out their nostrils. They got tired of eating quail. Those people were so doggone flesh. Now, after about 40 years, right, they all died off. But one of the things they taught their kids was when they say go, go and shut up. Because yeah. when Joshua said it's time for us to cross over, nobody complained. Nope. Not one person complained. They didn't get to go in, but their children went in. And their children went in knowing there were giants in land. But see, there were. You know what they asked them when they finally got there? What took y'all so long? Can you imagine being the people, being the housekeeper of God's property for his people, waiting for any day for his people to show up and take it and kick you out? For 40 years they lived that way, and when Israel got there, they said, what took you guys so long? Because they had heard all the stories of how God brought them out. They had heard the plagues of Egypt. They had heard about the splitting of the Red Sea, and they knew they were toast. It's just that Israel's flesh got in the way, and they didn't know that they were going to be toast for them. But see, you had a man of faith there. His name was Caleb. And he told Joshua, he told Moses when he went to the land, came back to Moses and said, look, there's a mountain there, I want it. Moses said, well, when you get over there, it's yours. Well, they went in, took them five years to run all the inhabitants out of all the different cities and so forth. And Joshua, I mean, Caleb came to Joshua after five years. He said, now look, I was, I was 40 when we came over here. I'm 85 now. Now, Moses told me I could have that mountain. There are giants up there, but I want my mountain. And the old dude went and took it. Yeah. Booted the giants off and everything. Amen. It's time for us to take the land. It's time for us to live spiritual. It's time for us to live holy. It's time to leave Egypt to Egypt. And stop trying to stink and figure out how we can get, keep some of the... Another example, I'm sorry. Remember one of the places where, they, where, where Israel was going in and, they, and God told them to destroy everything and to keep nothing for themselves? Yep. And somebody got cute and kept a, kept a little bit of, of, of souvenir yeah, yeah. and hid it in their tent. Yeah. Didn't go too good for them. You go read and find out what happened to them. That's the last record we have of them. Because there was no more record of them. After that day. There's nothing to record because they won't hear anymore. What was God saying? The provision of the Lord is what you need. You don't need the provision of the world. No, and that, don't, don't go quit your job and go home. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is we have, to, we have to trust in God. We have to look to God. We have to separate ourselves to God. There's nothing that the world has that's worth sacrificing our walk with the Lord to get or to keep. Amen. Well, I, I, but I think it's hard to do this and still serve the Lord. Is it really worth it? What is it about that that's so great, whatever it is, just so awesome that you want to do it and walk right past a supernatural 
event with God over here because you're just too consumed with doing this and being like this and catering to your flesh. I'm not just saying living in sin. I'm talking about catering to your flesh. My flesh is more important. Is your flesh more important than that visitation with God? Where he could give you the answer to everything in life in one word? What did Brother Copeland say? One word from God will change your life forever. Well, I want to, I'm, I'm, I, we used, I, I know somebody that used to, well, years ago was with, with us. And I'll be honest with you, this is, this is one of the turning places in their life. They wouldn't start hanging out with their old buddies. Doing stuff with their old friends all the time. Mm-hmm. They weren't even serving the Lord right. It's one thing to minister to people. It's another thing to go hang with all your old buddies. I don't go hang with all my old buddies. Now if, I, now, if I walked into a restaurant today in Greensboro, and I had some guys I went to high school with or whatever, and they were all sitting in there, I may go sit down with them and talk to them for a little while, but I'm not going to, you know, make plans to go off to the beach for weekends and drink and party while they drink and party, and I sit there and read my Bible. We're supposed to be light. Yeah, we're supposed to be light. We're not supposed to be, you know, you, you know, Jesus went and ate with publicans and sinners to minister to them and then came back to his own people. He didn't hang with them. He went there to minister to them. And also I started, and I saw people, I've seen people turn their whole life in a different direction because they started hanging out with their old buddies. What is it? That, that Egypt started getting back on them. And those people, these people said, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a cussing Christian. That's an oxymoron. Yeah. Doing what, do, keep doing what the world does. It will pull you. Listen, these, the reason I'm saying this, these things are pulls and weights on your life. They were trying to grab you and bring you back into where you came out of. And didn't you want to be free from that in the first place? We're going to change our service times. <laughs> we have to go back to 10 o'clock. I, I, I've, I've, I've disobeyed my own word. The short winded shall preach again. There's a pull. And see, we're to grow. We're to get a, we're, we're to, as, children, as, as we grow in the things of God, we're to put away childish things. We mean childish things, acting like a child. Realizing things in life are more important than other things. How many remember when you were a teenager or whatever, some things were like, you know, the most important thing in the world? Hello? Getting your driver's license. If you didn't get it on the day you turned 16, the world was going to end. I didn't get mine until the, four, the, to, to the 3rd of September. That was three days after my birthday, and there were no nuclear explosions between uh, Jan- August 31st and September 3rd, 1972, 74. What? 1974. August 31st to January 3rd, 1974, there were no nuclear explosions. There was no collapses of the Empire State Building. There was nothing happening in the world. And, 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 and I, you know, we think that they're going to have catacosmic events, catacosmic events on the earth if certain things don't happen a certain way. And they're not. when you get a hold of spiritual things, you begin to realize a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. We begin to realize that some things aren't as imperative in my timetable. I'm just going to walk with the Lord. Can you say amen? Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your spirit dealing with people. I know that there is a dealing and a... A bidding by the Spirit. And let me say this. I know that I know that I know in the Spirit that God's dealing with people along certain lines because there's something going on. I've sensed it in the Spirit. And the Spirit of God's addressing it. And the Spirit of God's giving you opportunity to make the adjustment before it brings calamity to your life. Do not reject the dealings of the Lord 
but yield to his biddings. Submit yourself to his voice and allow him to bring you into the path he has laid before you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Now, I'm not going to try to deal with it in the flesh. This is the Lord. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's there. How do you know it's there? I'm sensing in the Spirit. I know by the Spirit. I know by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Glory be to God forever. Everybody say, glory be to God forever. Let's all stand up. Father, we just we speak over these people. Father, as you've dealt with their hearts and you've spoken to them by the Holy Spirit, I thank you that they do not reject the word of the Lord, but they receive it and embrace it and yield to your voice. And adjustments are made. Destruction is averted. Blessing and peace and tranquility is the path before those who will yield and hear the voice of the Spirit. He that has ears to hear what the Spirit says, let him hear. We thank you, dear Father, for the adjustments and changes that are made. We thank you, dear Father. No, 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 no. I, I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Lord, we just, just pray for them. I pray for them. That their heart, their heart is pliable. They receive the word of the Lord. Yes, yes, Lord, let that that dress could let them the meski be. Let that be a Debra Duskra, Nahanda de Bada. Ungre diski de Bad. Haglos could do. Yes, the debiski, the baby turn aside. Turn aside from that. And miss, and miss, and miss that which the enemy has set before them. You know, in the Old Testament, the prophet Balaam was paid to go curse his own people. And the Lord told him not to do it. But he kept offering the money. Even though he knew he wasn't to do it, he went to do it anyway. As he was on his way, his donkey fell over and fell on his leg, and he started whipping the donkey and the donkey started talking. Now, I'm, I'm going to just kind of paraphrase this for you a little bit. He said, why are you beating me? He said, there was the angels up there getting ready, to, getting ready to cut your head off. Because the Lord told you not to go. Don't wait till the donkey start talking. Hello? You can, you, can, you, you, you can miss that whole donkey talking thing. <laughs> Hello? And he still tried to figure out a way to do it. He was, just, he was messed, just totally messed up. That's carnal. Hello? Well, what do you mean? Well, you don't have a donkey. What if your car started talking to you? What if the radio turned on and started saying, Yes, thus, thus saith the Lord. You're not in the preacher's wife of Denzel Washington either. The Lord's talking to you. The Lord's been speaking to this church, people in this church. Now know this. The Lord speaking to you this way. For some people, they haven't been listening to him speak to their own hearts. And this is your final warning to make an adjustment and a change. Because you could go to your own devices. And then the next thing is, be careful what you ask for. I want to go back to Egypt. The Lord might, might let you go back. 
And let me tell you, you will be sorry. You will, as old folks used to say, you will rue the day you did if you do. There's nothing there. I said, there's nothing there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you for the, what you're doing in the hearts. And thank you for the sensitivity to the Spirit that you're wooing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.